Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Tropical plants love the heat and are colorful all summer long. Today, we're going to look at a few options. Also, pH is one of the most important things in a garden. Get it wrong and your garden won't grow so well. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Joellen Diamond. Joellen is the Director of Landscape at the University of Memphis, and Celeste Scott will be joining me later. All right, Joellen. I know you like tropical plants, don't Yes, you? tropical plants. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about those tropical plants. Yeah, and now, Chris, most tropical plants, all of them bloom and set fruit. Okay. But there's a lot of them that are just grown for their foliage, and we're going to go over some of those first. Good. Good. First one are the elephant ears, or the alocasias, yeah, or the like the colocasia. This is a colocasia here, um, and xanthosomas. You know, they are anywhere from two feet to six feet tall. Some of the, the leaves just get larger as the plant gets bigger, right. uh, like the elephant ears. They like full sun to shade. Uh, anything in between, moist, well-drained soil. Mm -hmm. But one thing you've got to remember, you've okay. got, you know, if you've got kids and plants, you've got to remember that these are toxic to humans and to pets. So you've got, you've got yeah. to be careful where you plant them if you have kids and pets. Okay. And, and, and Glad you mentioned that. Yeah. So, and then there are gingers. And this one here <laughs> is a ginger. This is the variegated shell ginger. And this is the alpinia variegated uh, shell ginger. There is also a tricolor ginger. This is a, a different variety. They are about two to three feet tall in height. Of course, the variegated leaves means that it can take a little more sun than some of the others. Uh, but all of them like wet, moist, well-drained soil. Okay, there's a pattern here, right? But, yeah, you're, you're gonna hear this a lot. Okay. Moist, well-drained soil. <laughs> Um, next are the palm trees. Uh, you know, you, any the palm trees range from two feet to ten feet uh -huh. plus. So any size of, uh, of palm tree, their fronds are beautiful, mm -hmm. give a different nice. look to the landscape. They like sun to partly sh uh, sunny, and some will even take more shade than a lot of the other tropicals. Okay. Can we actually grow palm trees here at Azon? Actually, there in are a few. B? Yeah, there are a few that will live through the winter here. Okay. Uh, sometimes when we get the zone six winter, it, it will uh, kill them to the ground, and sometimes they come up and sometimes they don't. Wow. Okay. But there are a few that we can keep here. Okay. Um, next, Hawaiian tea plant, the cordelins. Bright pink, uh, a plant that actually can take the shade huh. and be colorful in the shade. In fact, the more sun it gets, It'll turn more green, and if it's in too deep of shade, it will turn green. How about that? But it's okay. got a, there's a, yeah. a happy medium in between that it likes, and it's bright pink and burgundy, and it's just gorgeous. Oh, that's interesting, though. Yeah, in the sun, yeah. Yeah. Green. Okay. Some sometimes yeah. when, well, like like this tree, this one here, you see it. it the leaves are burned probably because it got too wet yeah. in the winter. Okay. This is caused by too wet. Um, uh, it can, uh, that's mostly the first sign of too wet is that the leaves will start turning these weird colors. Oh, that's good. Okay. So that's just good. watch out for that. And next, bananas. <laughs> okay. I, there are all kinds of new banana uh -huh. varieties out there. They're, they don't produce bananas necessarily. They're grown or, for ornamentals. Okay. And they're about two to three feet tall. And in mass in a, in a bed, they look really nice. Mm -hmm. It's, and by themselves, they look nice. Yeah. And then, of course, you can get other banana varieties that are even taller, so up to 10 or more feet. Yeah. Around here, you know, it, you've, I've seen people that had them, and they cut them back, mm -hmm. and they come back. Some of them are perennial, some of them are annual, but they're all uh, musa species, uh -huh. and they have very large leaves. It kind of a nice, dramatic addition to your, your I, landscape. I like yeah. Moist, well-drained soil, sun well to part soil. sun, you know. <laughs> It's, it, it's, they're a, a good addition. And then, you, then you've got Dracaenas. Oh, yeah. Now that's no, gonna I be like a very popular 
Uh, but mostly what I see for the outdoors are the marginata types, the very spiky, uh, thin-leaved ones. Okay. And they're usually variegated or green or usually a red, a dark red right. color. I've seen the dark red color. And, and they put them in containers with mm. other plants. And that's how usually those are used. They get about two feet tall. Uh, again, sun to partly okay. sunny areas. And the more color it has, the more sun it can take. Okay. So, yeah. It, it also is toxic to humans wow. and to pets. Then we've got crotons. Everybody <laughs> knows crotons. They're, right. they're, they are the, one of the sunniest, most bright. It makes you smile when you uh, see I them because like they're so, yeah. so colorful and, and cheerful looking. Mm -hmm. um, they like sun to partly sunny areas. They're one to three feet tall. Uh -huh. Uh, they mix well with others, but one of the things uh, you, and I say well-drained soil, and you kind of put an underline and it's highlighted for this one because the number one cause of it not it failing for anybody is because it gets too wet. Too wet, okay. Yeah, okay. that people like it too much and they water and think, oh, well, it needs water. Well, not necessarily. Oh. It likes to be kind of dry side. Yeah, I like them. But also one thing you know about them is of all of the plants, they are probably the most toxic <gasps> of all of the tropical plants. That I didn't know. Okay. Yeah, oh. they got a milky uh, 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 kind of sap in them that's very toxic to in, you know to people and to to pets. Oh wow! Okay. So, if you got a place to put them out of the way where nobody's going to get to them, then. I think they're wonderful. Next is copper plant, and I yeah. have one of these here. I love this. This is, these, this is so pretty. The burgundy, it's got bright pink flames on it, and <laughs> it, they can have yellow on them and white, and they are just very variegated, but they, they do very well. And uh, of course, that is a, a califa species. You know, it's part of the acalypha family. See the the blooms on it that kind of remind oh, yeah, you okay. of the acalypha. Got it, okay. Yeah. So they are very brilliant and, and bright in the landscape and do well in the ground or in containers, wherever you want to put them. And again, well-drained soil. Well don't, okay. don't overwater him. <laughs> don't overwater him. Now, that's most of the tropicals that are, you know, just going around for foliage. Okay. Now let's talk about some that bloom, too. That yeah, we really like blooms. the blooms that's on right. it. And that's going to be hibiscus. Yeah. This is this one down here, nice pink. Um, they come in all colors: reds, whites, yellows, oranges, doubles, singles, you name it. Beautiful, two to four feet tall. Again, well-drained soil. <laughs> and you know, all of the ones that bloom could benefit from some fer supplemental fertilizer throughout the growing season. Maybe once a month, put okay. some fertilizer on it. Okay. Next is mandevilla. Mm -hmm. Mandevillas can either be a vine or a bush. It comes in whites, reds, and pinks. Love, yeah. I usually see them out by mailboxes. Like my neighbor oh, has one out by That's why they do well because yeah. how often do you water around yeah. your mailbox? Yeah, so, right. you know, they, a lot of these plants do well with being a little dry. Right, okay. In between their waterings. Uh, shrimp plant, mm -hmm. that's the one, you know, there's yellows and kind of a pale red color. Okay. And so they do well also, well-drained soil, sun to partly sunny areas, okay. does good. And then of course, one that we, <laughs> bougainvillea. Oh, we, yeah. can't, we can't not talk <laughs> about bougainvillea because it, it, the blooms on it are vibrant oh, and, and gorgeous. The only thing I can say beware of is that it has thorns. Yeah. <laughs> it has yeah. thorns. Yeah. So beware of that and, yeah. uh, you know, just put yeah. it in an area where you don't brush up against it all the time because right. you might get stuck by one of its thorns. It is a beautiful plant. It's, it's beautiful. Sure. And yeah. then, of course, the last one that you can see a lot of around here is Bird of Paradise. Oh, yeah. And, okay. and even when they don't bloom, I think the foliage is beautiful and containers and, and, and again, bigger mm -hmm. leaves and give a different texture. They're, they grow more upright, whereas the colocaceas, you can see, have them kind of sweep down with right. their leaves. So you get all these different t textures and colors to, to really, really ha add a tropical feel okay. to your garden. All right, Joe, that was good. That's good. We can tell you like tropical plants. I love tropical plants. <laughs> Thank you much. It looks like Japanese beetles are back. How can I tell? Look at the skeletonized leaves. Japanese beetles attack over 300 species of plants. They have chewing mouth parts. They like to chew or eat 
the plant tissue right in between the veins, hence the skeletonized leaves. So how do you control Japanese beetles? Uh, there's a couple of ways to do that. One is just get a bowl of warm soapy water and just knock them in. That'll get them, especially if you do that in the morning time or late in the evening because they're eating so much, you know, at that point in time, they're real sluggish and they're easy just to knock in. Or if you want to use a low impact pesticide, I would recommend using neem oil. Yes, neem oil. It is an oil from the azotoractin tree and it should help reduce the number of Japanese beetles that you will have on your plant material. All right, Celeste. Hey. Let's talk a little bit about pH because pH is so important and you're gonna tell us why it's so important, right? It is so important yes. and, and folks just don't realize how important mm -hmm. it is. So I know that we preach uh, with extension and, yes. and many other professions, uh, preach the importance of soil sampling um, before you begin any kind of gardening endeavor, whether that's, you know, vegetable gardening mm -hmm. or landscaping or what have you, um, but it truly is super important. Um, if nothing else, to be able to determine what your pH is right. or the uh, level of acidity in your soil. What pH stands for, it's a little P and a big H. And a big H, yeah. right. <laughs> so that stands for potential hydrogen. Okay. Um, hydrogen is acidic, and so that's just measuring the level of how much uh, potential hydrogen is in your soil okay. um, and telling you whether it's acidic or basic. Um, pH runs on a scale of 0 to 14, mm -hmm. and it's exponential. So, for example, 7 is right in the middle, so right. that's what we're going to call neutral. Anything below 7 would be considered acidic, mm -hmm. or old, some old-timers say it's sour. Yes, yeah? sour. So, it's sour or <laughs> right. acidic. Anything above mm -hmm. is basic, right. alkaline, or, uh, again, sweet. sweet. You may refer to right. it as sweet versus sour. Um, so that's kind of how it goes. Now, if we're looking at a pH, if we tested our soil and it came back a pH of 5, mm -hmm. and we were going to compare that to another area that came back with a pH of 6, it doesn't appear to be that much difference because you're thinking, well, it's just one number, right. you know, different. But like I said, it's on an exponential scale. So that's a pH point. of 5 is really 10 times more acidic than a pH of 6. Likewise, if you move up to a 7, a five would be a hundred mm -hmm. times more acidic. So every full single number mm -hmm. that you move up, you're you know moving exponentially. So it really right. does make a big difference. All right, good stuff. Mm -hmm. So what causes an acidic soil though? Well, there's lots of different situations. Okay. So in West Tennessee, a lot of soils are naturally acidic. Mm -hmm. And that is just determined by the parent material that your soil was made out okay. of. So like mm -hmm. the bedrock that you know, was degraded and now has become mm -hmm. your topsoil. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is dependent upon that. Um, there are also some practices that humans do <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that could create uh, acidic <laughs> soils. Right. So let's think about, um, there's lots of development going on. Yes. And so anytime topsoil is removed, mm -hmm. you're removing some of the uh, natural amendments of the soil and, exactly. and you could end up with a more acidic soil. Um, New homes, lots of times when they remove that topsoil and then they're backfilled with what they think might be topsoil, but it isn't really. Um, and so... <laughs> yeah, not exactly. <laughs> right. right. They could end up with acidic soils that way. Also, um, just continued use of land. Mm -hmm. uh, plants are taking uh, soluble nutrients out of the soil. So things like, you know, potassium, magnesium, uh, calcium, and when those are removed from the soil solution or even removed from water, if you're having lots of rain or something like that, those can be replaced with right. those hydrogen ions, which cre increases the acidity of your soil. Okay. So any kind of land that's in continuous use um, might have the potential to be low, uh, have a low pH or have a more acidic soil. Okay. All right, so what are the benefits of sampling in the fall, though? Right. I mean, because you can sample any time, yeah, correct? Yeah. But the fall mm -hmm. just tends to be a little better, you think? Yeah, I think. Okay. You can sample any time of the year, sure. and you can amend any time of the year. But yeah. for me, um, most of the time, especially if we're talking about vegetable gardening, mm -hmm. you know, okay. we're, right. we've got to have some forethought with this. You want to start a new site in the spring, or you had problems in your garden site this past year, and you want to uh, try to get ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. Sample in the fall. 
Um, the lab is usually slower. <laughs> it is. It is in the fall. It is. Because in, in the spring is when people are getting geared oh, up yeah. usually, and so they're sending in lots of samples. So the lab is generally a little slower. You can get your results a little faster. Our soils tend to be drier in the fall, mm -hmm. and it, when you send in a soil sample, it really needs to be dry. Okay. If it's not dry when it gets to the lab, then they have to let it dry. So that could add a few days onto okay. your sampling time. Um, and then, of course, if you live in West Tennessee like we do, mm -hmm. here in the Mid-South, yes. <laughs> or in the Mid-South in general, mm -hmm. I guess we should say, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> your soils are going to naturally be on the more acidic right. side. So we're looking at probably around 6 to 6.5, could even be lower, you okay. know, just depending upon where you are. So if we need to amend that pH and raise it, um, we're going to do that by adding lime. And lime takes time to change sure. Uh, the chemistry of the soil. It's not something that's going to happen immediately. So that's why I like to test in the fall so you can go ahead and get that lime on the ground now and by the time spring comes around you've already started that process of changing okay. the chemical you know makeup. Uh, so it'll be ready to go for the most part because it gets weathered in and broken down. Right, okay. yes, yes. Well, I got that. So that's why I prefer fall. Okay, uh, while we have a little time left, suggested pH for plantings though. Yes. What are some of those? Okay, so if we're looking at like lawns, okay. I would say most turf grasses, uh, 6 to 6.8. I mean, you could go a little lower. Okay. Um, don't want to go too much higher. Uh, they tend to kind of prefer some of that okay. acidic, acidic soils. Areas that are naturally kind of like wooded, if you have a wooded lot around your home, right. those soils are going to be naturally more acidic because they're having a lot of leaves and things right. falling and yeah, decomposing. decomposing. Right. Um, so that would be common, you okay. know, for that type of area. Gardens, vegetable gardens in general, again, we're looking at probably 6.0 to 6.8, okay. somewhere around that area, where you want to really make sure you have... Um, more extremely acidic soils will be for crops like blueberries. Yes. Yeah. So yes. there you'd be looking at like 4.8 to 5.2. Yes. Man, low. Yeah. Okay. So if you test an area and you're not sure what you want to do with that piece of your property and it comes back low okay. in that range, maybe you would want to plant blueberries there because then you don't have to fight with amending that pH um, because pH doesn't stay changed. You know, right. you have to stay on top of it and That's continue right. um, to amend it if you want to move the natural good point. level of that, that pH of that soil. Okay. Well, since you're there, let's quickly talk about how do you adjust the soil pH then? Oh, okay. Yeah. Definitely. So, um, we can really only know amounts if we get our soil sample, like how okay. much we need to add. So that's another reason why it's so important. If we want to raise pHs okay. nearer to seven, you've got an acidic soil and you need to raise it nearer to seven, you're going to add lime. Okay. Um, right. For homeowners, uh, pelleted lime is going to be the product of choice. Sure. It's easy to apply, um, but then again, you know, it takes time to do its thing. Okay. We, I would not put more than 50 pounds per thousand square feet out at a time. Interesting. Okay. Because there, there again, you may be getting a lot of waste mm. if you over apply. Okay. If you put 200 pounds out, it's not all going to be able to do its thing. Right, gotcha, so gotcha. sometimes if we have a drastic adjustment, you may have to split up that application into two or three applications throughout the year. Okay. So apply the, the first one now, wait two or three months, apply Five it again, years. wait two Makes or three sense. months, apply it again, and then retest okay. um, to see where you've gotten yourself to and how much more you need, you need to go from there. If you have, um, if you're trying to go the opposite way and lower your pH, mm -hmm. <laughs> say that you have a spot that tests like 6.8, but you really want to grow blueberries there, or you really want to grow some acidic shrubbery there, uh, plants that prefer acid soils like azaleas, rhododendrons, mm -hmm. hollies, right. um, things like that. Adding sulfur right. can get you uh, down to that lower pH area where okay. you want to be. And that's that elemental Elemental, sulfur. elemental sulfur mm -hmm. uh, can do the job. I, I probably wouldn't want to use that um, every single time. Okay, okay. Aluminum sulfate uh, right. will do it as well. Um, so, you know, either product. And it just depends. There again, you need to have results from your soil sample to know how much you need to move. But as a rule of thumb, I think it's like 0.2 pounds per 100 wow. square feet. <laughs> 
to move it a tenth of, wow, a, okay. of a pH point. So it's you know going to take some calculations and some time, but we need to know what we're starting with before we start adding. Well, garden math. I know garden math. How about that? I'm always bringing math to the scene. I'm always bringing math. We got to have the you garden back. So, you, math so you can do the math. All right. <laughs> All right, Celeste, we appreciate it. that. Was good information. So thank you much. Thanks. All Thanks right. for having me. All right. mm -hmm. All right, we're out in the family plot garden. This is our tomato plant. It is always a good practice to mulch your tomato plants. And before we put down the mulch, I want to remove some of the nut sedge that we have around our tomato plant here. Now that the nut sedge has been taken up, right? We've gotten all of it up from around the tomato plants. It is now time for our mulch. Now you can use any type of organic mulch. So again, you need no more than two inches. It helps to conserve soil moisture. It actually also helps to regulate soil temperature. And of course, it will help to suppress weeds. And when you put your mulch down, make sure that you pull it back from the stem of the tomato plant. It doesn't need to touch the stem. And of course, by conserving soil moisture, right, and soil temperature, it helps with the tomatoes, right? Because those tomatoes will not crack, right? Because again, this mulch is helping it to conserve the moisture that is in the soil. All right, Joel, and here's our Q&A segment. You ready? I'm ready. These are great questions. Here's our first viewer email. I have had a good number of white pine trees that I've planted and they are, all have the same problem. An otherwise sturdy tree seems to die out at six to eight inches from the top. Why are the tips of my white pines dying? Any thoughts are greatly appreciated. Thanks, and this is Art. The white pine trees. Yep. The tips are dying. Tips are dying. We had a discussion about this. What yes, do you think? we did. What do you think about that? White pine weevils. It's the weevil. How about that? Yeah, they attack just the tips of the pine trees. Mm -hmm. And he should be able to see them at some point. But yeah, I would... You're supposed to cut out, spray insecticide, but you can actually cut out the section that they're in. Now that's going to, you know, with our apical dominance, yeah, that's going to take that. out that main leader, but that doesn't mean that the rest of the, of the plant will die. It'll just send, send more shoots more evenly out. Right. It won't just be as tall, single trunk. But yeah, that's, that's a major problem. Mm -hmm. Major problem, major insect pests of yep. white pine. Of in the United States. Mm -hmm. And to think about it, if you have tall white pine trees, then you have to figure something else out. Yeah. So I would call a certified, certified arborist. Yes. Have them to come out, mm -hmm. assess the damage for you. Yes. And they could possibly, you know, treat yeah. this issue for you. Right. Yeah. So an insecticide will probably be a soil systemic trench, is what I'm guessing. Would, would most likely right. be that. So that, they're they're eating on the bark, right? And in the cambium layer, which is what kills the top of the tree. But then they lay eggs, and so mm -hmm. the cycle continues. Right. Yeah. If you have shorter trees, yeah, you can just you can I would them. just prune it out. Prune it out. Right. But if you have taller trees, then yeah, it's probably going to be a soil systemic trench. Yeah. Right. But contact the certified arborist. Yeah. Just make sure that's what it yeah, is. Yeah. Make sure that's what it is. Because they have bucket trucks and things that they can get yeah, up in the tree and, right. and assess it better than you right. can from the ground. And that way they can just prune it out instead of mm -hmm. having to use, you know, an insecticide if you mm -hmm. don't want to use that. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. But it is uh, those weevils are a problem. Major pest. Pine. How about that? All right. All right. Hope that answers your question. Yeah. Contact the certified arborist. All right. Let them come out there and uh, assess that damage for you. All right. Here's our next viewer email. I have a yucca plant that has got a white colored fungus on the leaves. Mm -hmm. It seems to be originating from the base of the leaves. What do I need to do to get rid of this? Also, can the fungus transfer to other plants? Do I need to isolate the plant away from my others? Please help. Thank you, and this is Shirley. So can we help Miss Shirley out? We can help Shirley. Let's Ms. help Shirley. her out. Okay. Yeah, mealy bugs, those are mealy so bugs. bugs. Yeah, right. and it might be because it's too wet or it's too shady. Uh, There's some kind of stress going on. Some kind on. of stress right. going on because yucca's like it hot and dry. Right. And so, um, but she can control, I, for one thing, I would put it in more sun and mm -hmm. in and, and a well-drained area. That's the first thing I would do to try to, to naturally control 
the mealy bug, but then you can put neem oils and insecticidal soaps, and she can even wipe it yeah. off with alcohol if she really wants to. Right. But uh, And yeah, I, it will go from plant to plant if that plant is stressed and, mm -hmm. and can take so. Mm -hmm. it soap. It definitely can do that. It can go from and plant to plant. In front of the picture, plant. you know, it is in a pot. Yeah. yeah. So it uh, should be, sure. you know, fairly easy uh, to control. Yeah. Uh, again, the low impact pesticides, like you mentioned, I would use the neem oil, horticultural oil, insecticidal soap, know the life cycle. I would get them when they're young, yeah. when they're yes. in the larva stage, they're easy to control uh, during, those, uh, during that stage. And uh, yeah, you probably see some city mode uh, because they have piercing sucking mouth parts. They feed on plant sap. They're going to produce honey dew. Yeah. All right. And so yuccas you have good sap control. for that. So yeah. got to get them under control. And I think you'd be fine. So low impact pesticides, Miss Shirley, that will do it for you. Yeah. And put, get it some more sun. And give it some more sun. And don't overwater <laughs> it too much. All right. Yeah. Not too much water. Yeah. Because we definitely don't want to stress it out. Right. All right. All right, Charlie. Fun as always. Thank you yes, much. Yes, it is. All right. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplots 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. If you want more information on tropical plants or soil pH, including how to do a soil test, go to familyplotgarden.com. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.